Um, it's such an honor and pleasure to have Leah Gunturo with us today. I'm such a fan. Leah, please tell us about Living Histories. Thank you, Sri, for the invitation. I, I really, really appreciate the theme of this talk series, and that's why I put out this quotation, because I think there really is no set path to be a scientist. And as Melos's words capture, I'm a scientist today, and also the kind of a scientist today because of the people that I have I happened to meet along the way. So I grew up in uh, Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, in a city called Surabaya. This is the second largest city in the world's fourth most populous country. And yet it still managed to feel like a small town. So I grew up in a tight-knit community of first and second generations um, of Chinese immigrants there. And of course, we had a very vibrant food culture. So if you ever get there to Indonesia, please do try this uh, turmeric chicken soup that CNN has dubbed as one of the best chicken soups in the world. <laughs> so growing up, although I, I did well in school, going to graduate school was never in the horizon. But like all Chinese families though, education is number one in our family. So early on, my parents worked hard and were very determined to send me abroad for university. But the goal was always to study something useful, like business, engineering, or computer science, so you can make a living. So in search for a good engineering school, I ended up all the way from the tropical equator to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And I was to study chemical engineering. And the weather was not the only shock because I did not do my research thoroughly enough, I found out only when I arrived that Madison was and continues to be a top party school in the US. <laughs> well, it was all in good fun. And it was for me an amazing experience to be in Madison to study engineering. It's very good engineering school in my mind. And more importantly, had I not gone to Madison, I would not have met a mentor that changed the course of my life. So I don't know if you guys remember, you know, way, way back then in college, or maybe not so way, way back then for some of you, you know, that one, one or two classes that were taught by alternate professors, and everyone is telling you that you should avoid taking it this year because it's the harder professor. Well, that was thermodynamics for us. And the professor to avoid was Juan de Pablo. So, and I tried, I tried to follow my senior's advice, but I just could not fit it into my schedule. So I had to take thermo when Juan was teaching it. Otherwise I would not be able to graduate in time. But then the class turned out to be incredibly stimulating. I think he taught it partially in graduate level course. We were studying polymer physics in his class. And then uh, at the end of the class, he called me and asked if I wanted to join his lab as an undergraduate researcher. And after six months in his lab researching phase transition, he called me to his office and told me that I should consider applying to graduate schools. So that was the first time it occurred to me, ah, maybe graduate school. So thanks to his letter, I landed at Princeton. And because I worked on phase transition in Juan, and one's lab, and because Princeton had, still has one of the most prominent labs researching phase transition in water, I was dead set in my mind that I wanted to join that lab, and I wanted to work with on water. But then, at the same year when I arrived, there was a new professor starting at Princeton, and rumors started circula uh, circulating among us students that he was working, he was offering project on flies. And for chemical engineering students, that was scandalous. So oh, you work on fruit flies? So long story short, I ended up joining this new professor's lab. And here is now, not so new anymore, the star swordsman. And I was going advised with this remark by this remarkable uh, fly geneticist, Trudy Schubach. And together, they introduced me to this magical world of developmental biology. It was really with their guidance that I really realized what a fun world was doing science. 
and I could start imagining my life. Ah, I could start imagining spending my life doing science. It was just so nice to be able to be on your own and trying things out. But much as Princeton years were formative, it was also very intense. And I was pretty burned out by the time I graduated. And that made me very unsure about wanting to stay, continue in academia. Because as much as I love doing science, I did not want to be stressed or burned out all the time. So I went to look for postdoc with that mindset in mind. It's like, can I do science and yet at the same time not be burdened or stressed the whole time by all the pressures? So around the time that I went to look for a postdoc, a new department was established at Harvard. That's the Department of Systems Biology. And the chair, the first chair of the department wrote a commentary in cell. And he tried to define what this new field was, what's systems biology. So you can read a whole two or three definitions in which in my mind, he practically dodged defining what systems biology is. But what's really interesting is that he ended, he ended his commentary by saying that this was a good field in his mind for those seeking risk and adventure. So I thought since I had nothing to lose anyway, I applied to his lab and lucky for me, he invited me to come to his lab and an adventure it was. So first of all, Mark introduced me to the world of cell biology, but not only that, through him and meeting other faculty and students and postdocs in the department, that really opened my eyes to just so many different ideas. So this was truly a formative time for me. And I think it's not just the place or the people I met, but because I was, I was older then, I was less insecure about where I came from. So as a result, I was able to take in more from the world around me. And I met some friendships. I'm, I formed some friendships that truly last to this day. And I think it was because of this richness and the sense of play that Mark built in his lab that made me really want to try to stay in academia and try to look for a job. And luckily, I was able to find a place here now at Caltech. And this theme that the problem you choose to work on, the kind of a scientist you are, it continues to this day in my lab. We choose the problems we work on because of the students that happen to found their way to the lab. Like John Hoffield said in his talk, that you choose a problem by trying to match the problem with your talent and background. And every student comes with different talents, different backgrounds and different aesthetics. And we just follow what we like to do. And over the years, we ended up working on many different problems. So thank you again, Sri, for the invitation. This has been a, a, a nice pause for me just to reflect on this years and, and just thinking about how I came to be where I am. Thank you. Uh, wow, thank you, Leah. I'm clapping on behalf of the audience. Um, while I uh, wait for the audience to send me more questions by chat, I'll start with the first one, uh, which is um, so lovely to hear you point out the sense of play that was nurtured in Mark's lab, which helped, you said, helped you stay on in academia. Um, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about how you incorporate the sense of play into your current work uh, and what you pass on to your students. And also in the context of the flavor of biology that we have now, is it a little bit more difficult than when you were with Mark? Oh, I think that, I think that we could always, well, <laughs> It is hard if you think about getting grants, writing papers, dealing with reviewers. Yes, but I think on like what David uh, pointed out, it's like you choose you choose to do what you enjoy doing every day, and that what makes it fun. The kind of things that you think about and the questions you ask. I encourage students just to try to read about other things, and also if they have site observations, they're excited about. You know what? Have site projects. And sometimes the side projects, as a, as I've experienced multiple times, turned out to be the one that is most exciting. Yeah. Um, one more question. 
um, would you highlight uh, for us how you felt that the immigrant experience was similar or different from your peers? How my experience was similar or different? As an immigrant. Oh. Well, personally, I mean, it was, it was hard. I mean, English being the language, being the first barrier, and also that you don't pick up in, in social interactions. It's hard to pick up all the, the the gestures and the unspoken meanings. But I think I was just always lucky to to have to have found good friends along the way that helped. That that really, I think, what truly helped. Wow. On that uh, super positive note, thank you again for a wonderful talk and these wonderful answers. I'm closing the recording.